before that. I told you I made a date with two guys one night. No. <laughs> God, no. That, that is... Forget about that. <laughs> one was a soldier. Unknowingly to most of our audience, last summer on June 25th, 2019, my wonderful grandmother, Mary M. Stiles Isella, passed away at the age of 93. But luckily before she passed away, I was able to capture her life story in a documentary my sister and I have watched dozens of times since then. And I'll leave a link to it below so you can see the full thing. I was also able to come out to her as gay on June 18th, 2018, just about one year prior to her passing. And I'm incredibly lucky to have had the opportunity to tell her in person. And I'm even luckier that she continued to love me the same ever since then. She even welcomed my ex-boyfriends into her assisted living apartment for our weekly family game nights before she got really sick. See, my grandmother and I always shared a special connection because she acted more like a mother to me and took care of us. But I remember so many times playing Go Fish or some other card game in her dining room as a young child. On those game nights, my grandmother and I were the only ones awake in the whole house. She'd have her coffee and I would have my milk while I asked my grandmother to tell me stories and answer questions about my uncle and her son, Jeffrey Blake. Now, some have asked me how I can feel somewhat of a close connection with a man I never met in person. After all, Jeffrey passed away on March 2nd, 1992, four months before I was born. But in a way, I feel like life cheated me out of a close friend. Not just because our family isn't really that big to begin with, but because of how similar Jeffrey and I grew up. Jeffrey was born on June 6th, 1946. He was raised in a little town called Mahanoy City, PA, with his mother, Mary, father, Louis, and his sister. He went to St. Canicus Catholic grade school in downtown Mahanoy City, PA. He then attended the town's public high school called Mahanoy Area. So far, Jeffrey and I's childhood stories mirror each other equally with my attending of St. Stephen's and St. Ambrose Catholic grade schools and public high school at Pottsville area. But our stories are much, much closer in resemblance to each other than just the fact that both of us attended similar schools. According to stories from my grandmother back when she was alive, like me, Jeffrey knew from a very young age that he liked other guys and was truly gay deep down inside. We both kept it a secret from everyone as children, but the reasons why we kept being gay a secret were vastly different. That looks innocent enough, doesn't it? Lots of young people hitchhike. Seems like a good way to get from one place to another. But sometimes there are dangers involved that never meet the eye. Let's take the case of Jimmy Barnes. Jimmy played baseball all afternoon and he didn't feel like walking home, so he decided to thumb a ride. He'd done it a hundred times before, and he didn't think anything was unusual when the driver struck up a friendly conversation. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. Jeffrey lived in a time when being gay was outlawed in the United States. In fact, he sadly never actually saw homosexuality become legal in the entire country. In those days, states had individual laws banning gay relationships. The federal Supreme Court ruling to ban all state homosexual sodomy laws came in 2003 with a judgment on Lawrence v. Texas. The U.S. Supreme Court today struck down a Texas law prohibiting gay men from engaging in sexual relations in their own homes. We had gotten a home run. We had actually won six to three. After this 2003 ruling, it took another 12 years for the Supreme Court 
to allow homosexual marriage in their landmark June 26, 2015 judgment on Obergfell B. Hodges. And because my uncle passed away in 1992, he never saw a day when either homosexual relationships or marriage were legal. A Supreme Court ruling announced minutes ago extends same-sex marriage in America. The justices rule five to four that states do not have the right to outlaw same-sex unions. The high court also ruled that all 50 states must recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states. It comes from a Supreme Court that just 30 years ago said gay people could be punished as criminals. Because of this, for most of his 45-year life, Jeffrey moved from city to city across the country, with the most notable being San Francisco, California, where many LGBTQ people sort of flocked to over those decades. My grandmother told me stories from his life when Jeffrey went partying in underground or basement clubs because being gay on the street was against the law. He even lived in an apartment with four to five other gay men, not as a relationship between them, but more so that way they can all talk openly and not have to fear saying something too gay in their own home. In the beginning of season two of our show, we spoke about gay flagging and the handkerchief code. Nowadays, it's a code us gay people, including myself, use at pride events or in life to showcase what we prefer in others. But as I said in that episode, it was a system which my uncle's generation used to avoid the police and identify each other out in public. So that way they would know who it was safe to talk to. This is something where even my late uncle used to do back before I was born and different cities that he lived in across America, like San Francisco or New York. But after high school, my uncle served our country as a member of the United States Navy and even fought in the Vietnam War. But he did so without telling anyone he was gay. Not only back home in the United States was it against the law, but ever since October 1949, the United States Department of Defense standardized anti-homosexual regulations across all branches of the military. In fact, many who were drafted in the Vietnam War actually avoided the draft because they told their pre-screening officers that they were gay. In the 1970s, the United States military was offering discharges to anyone who they found out was bisexual or gay an officer which was not found to commit any homosexual acts during his service was offered a general discharge. An officer who engaged in homosexual conduct was more likely to have received an undesirable discharge from the military. So my uncle didn't really have a choice to speak up about being gay if he wanted to serve our country. Being openly gay and serving in the military has been very back and forth between laws such as Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 1993. Our nation's policy toward homosexuals in the military. I believe the policy I am announcing today represents a real step forward, but I know it will raise concerns in some of your minds. And a final appeal, which was made on July 6, 2011. This appeal went through and is still the only current reason why gay people are currently allowed in the military. By repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell today, we take a big step toward fostering justice, fairness, and consideration, and that real cooperation President Eisenhower spoke of. But it's partly because of my uncle that in my strong opinion, your sexual orientation or gender identity shouldn't matter if you're willing to risk your life for our country. Yet rules regarding whether a gay or transgender person is allowed to openly serve in the military still continue to go back and forth, with an anti-trans policy being currently active under the Trump administration. He declared the United States government will not accept or allow transgender individuals to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. On other issues, it was my uncle's generation which first stood up for equal rights for the LGBTQ. On June 28, 1969, it was his generation which famously protested for civil rights in what we now call the Stonewall Riots. Back in those days, being gay was not only against the law, but according to the American Psychiatric Association, until my uncle was 28 years old, 
which is older than I am right now. Homosexuality was considered a mental illness up until 1974, when it was finally taken off of that list of illnesses. But back when my uncle was a child and he first knew he was gay, other LGBTQ people of all ages were famously being sent to an insane asylum such as Pennhurst State School in Spring City, PA. They were vastly overcrowded schools meant for the very mentally challenged, not LGBTQ. This led to many straight and cisgender people in the country who already didn't understand the LGBTQ now having reasons to fear our community because of the very mentally challenged people our community was being locked away with. For families, these hospitals gave them a way out from dealing with a young family member who came out to them as gay or transgender. They simply just sent them away to a state school and never had to think about them ever again. For those like my uncle who were lucky enough not to have ever been sent to one of these asylums, the only option was to stay silent and keep it on a need to know basis. Their entire life was spent in fear of anyone who wasn't meant to know finding out they were gay. Luckily, these asylums were shut down between 1955 and 1994, but families who want to kick their children out of their home just for being gay or transgender are still legally allowed to do so in the United States. So if you're planning on coming out, please watch our preparing episodes and protect yourself. All of those will be linked below. But getting back to our story and back to my uncle's generation, because of these stigmas, religious beliefs, and the reasons mentioned before, being gay was still a massive dark cloud and embarrassment you cast upon your family, even though it was in your DNA and you had no control over the situation. When I came out to my grandmother on June 18th, 2018, I asked her about my uncle once again, because I knew he wasn't really mentioned during family dinners growing up and no one really brought Jeffrey up in conversation to me unless I asked them about Jeffrey specifically first. My grandmother assured me that she was always accepting of Jeffrey being gay, but according to her, it was my grandfather, Louis Izella, who never fully accepted it, and therefore we never really spoke of Jeffrey too much as a family. It was all of these reasons combined which led many in my uncle's generation, including Jeffrey, to legally change their name so they could separate themselves from their family name. Because of my grandfather's lack of acceptance of him being gay, for my uncle this meant changing his birth name from John Izella to a new legal name of Jeffrey Blake. In fact, if you go to the Indian Town Gap National Cemetery in Anvil, PA, he is buried on the opposite side of the cemetery from his parents, Mary and Louis, under a headstone which reads no reference to the Izella family name. And you might ask what took my uncle from this life so young, at 45 years old? Well, according to my grandmother in our 2015 publications, her amazingly detailed stories of his life, and according to numerous other family members, Jeffrey passed away while living in Philadelphia, PA, from AIDS-related diseases. My uncle's generation was never taught proper LGBTQ sex education in school. Possibly if they were taught properly or if they had treatment options like they do now, my uncle would still be alive and I can ask him to come from behind the camera and talk for a while. But in a way, even his cause of death inspired me greatly, not just in my activism, but in my personal life as well. In an episode called Sex Ed and Gay Straight Alliances, our show began pushing for all schools in the United States to teach LGBTQ education and have GSA clubs. And now I push for those things working for much larger organizations like the Pennsylvania Equality Project. But for teenagers, we need to make gay sexual education mandatory right alongside straight sex ed. In an episode called Gay Loneliness and the Grinder Hookup Culture, I told you that I personally don't want to be in the hookup culture, and I firmly believe in love existing before any physical acts. What I didn't tell you in that episode was that I'm also way more cautious because of my uncle. 
In his afterlife, he taught me to never go for a hookup. He taught me never do something major without checking with your partner if they're clean first, but no matter what, use protection nonetheless. So in a way, my uncle taught me things that my school system and even my father's birds and the bees talk never did. For guys like me, those actions have to mean a whole lot more, and they only enter our relationship once love and trust are built strong enough. I'm not claiming to know every detail of my uncle's life, and I would like nothing more than to cut away to some footage of Jeffrey telling us all of his life stories. But sadly, all that survived were the detailed accounts passed down to me throughout my entire childhood and my adult life here. Although we have never shook hands, I can't help but feel two things whenever I think of my uncle. Firstly, I feel a bond between us that most people won't understand, but I do understand. It's the same bond I have with my brothers and sisters in rainbow arms at pride events. It's the bond we in the LGBTQ community all have connecting us. Only for my uncle and I, that bond is a little stronger because he's family to me. And second, I feel a deep appreciation for everything he went through and everything his generation did for ours. Sure, we still have many mountains to climb and we still need equality, equal education, equal blood donation abilities, free or affordable LGBTQ mental health services, and so many more things in this country to protect us. But when I think of how far we have come in just the past 50 years, it makes me realize that our goal of equality is attainable. Think of it like this. 47 years ago in 1973, my uncle would have been 27, the same age I am now. But life in his generation was vastly different than mine. We both kept our homosexuality a secret until we were much older compared to when we first knew it ourselves. But I kept it a secret because I didn't want people to know yet. It wasn't because I had any fear of getting sent to an insane asylum or locked in prison for the rest of my life. No one in my family is embarrassed of me. None of them see a dark cloud I put over them, and no one pushed me to change my name. My father accepts me for being gay, and he's happy for me when I have a boyfriend. He accepts that I will someday have a husband, and we might adopt kids of our own. But even our government fully accepts the fact that I can actually have a husband one day. And it's profound, the five to four vote in many ways reflecting the huge societal shift of the last 20 years. The president saying today there are days like this when that slow, steady effort is rewarded with justice that arrives like a thunderbolt. Even now that things have changed, some others from Jeffrey's generation have been so ingrained in that way of thinking and keeping it silent that they still to this day haven't come out and told everyone they're gay. Some still tried their best to hide it. When I was a kid, it was always worded to us as that man who lives alone down the street who never married, or that lonely old man, or my personal favorite, that man who lives with his roommate. At 27 years old, I've gone on many first dates with guys. My father taught me to meet up in public during daylight hours so I don't get murdered or robbed like others are nowadays, but none of those first dates have been in underground clubs requiring passwords for entry to keep the police out. But no joke, I've gone on a first date with a policeman, and my first thought wasn't if he was going to arrest me for being gay. I've had three boyfriends now, and I've held each of their hands in public with no worries. At 27, I can say I have lived to see a gay presidential candidate become a serious contender. So I just came out. I had no idea what kind of professional setback it would be, especially because, inconveniently, it was an election year in my socially conservative community. What happened was that when I trusted voters to judge me based on the job that I did for them, they decided to trust me and re-elected me with 80% of the vote. And I can happily report that gay and trans representatives and senators represent our country in our capital. On June 10th, 2018, when I came out to the world, I did so while standing on the steps of my nation's capital. 
I was surrounded by hundreds of thousands of my brothers and sisters singing along to a coming out song written and performed by an Australian gay singer-songwriter named Troy Savon. I have since been to many Pride events, and I wear rainbows every day of the week. I host multiple TV shows promoting the normalcy of being gay. I write songs and stories about the men I date and the crushes I have. I enter the Capitol buildings, speak at formal governmental meetings, fighting for equal rights. I have a rainbow flag flying outside my home all year long. So I'm not just proud of being gay, I'm proud as hell of my community in the LGBTQ, and I'm proud as hell of my tribe inside of it. But most importantly, while we still have work to do to reduce hate crimes, there's no doubt in my mind that my uncle's generation helped save lives, and their work reduced the number of stories we are faced with now, like the one in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. So there's no better way I can think of to start this season off than by saying thank you to the generations who have gone before and fought so hard for my rights to live as freely as I do now. Thank you to my uncle for teaching me so many life lessons from beyond his years. And thank you to my grandmother who wasn't afraid to tell me all about him and the struggles that he went through. He went grade one up through the eighth grade in St. Canicus. When I came out to my grandmother, she told me that she loves me just the way I am. But she worried that the world wouldn't love me with the same unconditional heart. I think she, more than any other, could tell you how much easier I and others in my generation have it compared to her own son. And I'm sorry in part that I now have to tell you by proxy. But I also saw her face and heard her remarks after she saw photos back when my ex-boyfriends and I were together. And random strangers stopped their day to take a photo of us kissing in public at photo hotspots, landmarks, and even photos of us at dinner on Valentine's Day. It is not lost on me how different my life is compared to my uncle. Only four months separated our entire lives, yet it was in my lifetime that it became legal to be who my uncle and I are in our innermost DNA. I wanted for my grandmother to be there when I walked down the aisle to my husband one day. But now I hope you can all understand how there's a small part of me that knows Jeffrey and her will still be there by my side whenever that day comes. I don't remember exactly about, the only thing I do remember about this game was if you kissed, if you got post office, I don't know how you got it, I forgot the game, but uh, I know you had a, you, you got to kiss a guy. And you'd go to the stairway, it had a little landing before you go upstairs, you open the door and you get in there with this guy and, ki and get a kiss from him. And that was the big prize. <laughs> about his life how he joined the military in the spring moved to San Francisco changed his name so if you can see me Blake know the world has changed and though there's still some bigot folks who love to hate 
from the Stonewall days I'm sure you'd be quite proud of all the progress made If you can see me, Blake talk for hours until the wee hours of the morn and the sun came up on South Mill but I never met him I feel cheated out of a friend cause he probably would have loved me more than some folks ever did so he hid his heart and died in 92 was born in July and never knew So if you can see me, Blake Know the world has changed And though there's still some bigot folks who love to hate Know the world has changed From the Stonewall days I'm sure you'd be quite proud of all the progress made you can see me Blake We were both boys when we figured out just what this love thing meant to us now a generation ago in his lifetime Love like ours meant prison for life So if you can see me, Blake I'm wearing rainbows today On the steps of the Capitol Cause love always beats hate So if you can see me, Blake Know the world has changed And though there's still some fucking assholes who just hate Know the world has changed From the Stonewall days I'm sure you'd be quite proud of all I meant to change I'm sure you'd be quite proud to change if you can see me Blake